Hello everyone, and welcome to part 9 of Insider's Guide. Today, we're discussing a less well-known ski resort that's been starting to make a name for itself. For those of you who are new, in this series, I share insider's tips and knowledge with all of you about ski resorts, aimed at maximizing your day. With that, let's begin in Insider's Guide to Ski Resorts, edition Wolf Creek. Now, Wolf Creek is well known to receive the most snow in Colorado. That's because it's remotely situated at the top of Wolf Creek Pass. As such, there is no on-site lodging, with the closest lodging in the small towns of Pagosa Springs and South Fork. A popular option is to stay in Pagosa Springs to ski during the day, and then come back and relax in the hot springs in the evening. The closest airports are Durango and Alamosa, both of which receive very limited commercial service. Denver International Airport is five hours away from Wolf Creek, making the I-70 corridor ski areas a much more popular option for people flying in. As such, Wolf Creek is one of my favorite ski areas to meet Colorado locals. Wolf Creek has a much higher percentage of locals on the slopes at any given time than a ski resort such as Vail or Breckenridge. Because of its remoteness, Wolf Creek can be great to get away from the touristic commercialization of the big I-70 resorts as ski experiences. You'll often hear that Wolf Creek isn't ever busy, which is only partially true. Come on a weekend powder day and you'll be sure to find plenty of lines and crowds. However, just as with any ski area, there are still ways to avoid the lines, and at Wolf Creek, it's pretty easy. One other thing to be aware of on those busy days is parking. I would highly, highly recommend getting to Wolf Creek well before the lifts open at 9. Parking can be a nightmare, as can be buying lift tickets, so be sure to give yourself plenty of time. And also, if you get there too late, you might find yourself parking in the overflow lots and having to ride the bus or take a hike to get to the ski area. When you get to Wolf Creek, it is definitely worth considering packing a lunch. There are relatively limited options for lunch, with the Alberta Grill really just a little snack shack, and the Raven's Nest and base area typically being pretty busy. If you are going to battle it out for a table at one of the mountain's dining options, be sure to have cash on you. This might have changed in the past season or two, but there was a point at which the food and beverage was cash only. One final consideration should be restrooms. Try to use the restrooms at the base or at Raven's Nest if possible, because most of the on-mountain restrooms, especially those on the Alberta side, are pit toilets. Alright, now, let's talk about the mountain itself. We'll start on the right side of the trail map and work to the left. The farthest right lift at Wolf Creek is Raven, a high-speed quad that is one of the busiest lifts at Wolf Creek. Coming off of Raven, a majority of people head down one of these two greens, Kelly Boyce Trail or Bunny Hop. These are the only popular big mountain beginner trails, and as such, can get very busy. You'll consistently find families and lower level skiers lapping Raven to a Kelly Boyce for the entire day. A word of note for Bunny Hop is that right here at the bottom of the trail, before it joins the run out to the base area, the trail does get steep. As such, it is designated as a blue in this area, named Caution Corner. There is this little cat track, Easy Out, that goes around the steep section as well. Just be ready to either go around on easy out, or hit a little bit steeper section if you're coming down bunny hop. Now, as I've said earlier, Raven is one of, if not the most popular lift in all of Wolf Creek. As such, these two green runs are also the most popular runs in all of Wolf Creek. I'll talk later about an alternative area to lap, but just be aware that at a ski resort that has a reputation for not being busy, the Raven area of the mountain can get rather crowded. If you want to lap Raven, uh, it typically opens at 8, a half hour before the rest of the lift. I would try to hit Raven right when it opens at 8, and ski it until about 8.45 or 9 when the masses begin to arrive. At that time, I would switch over to Bonanza. Now, I just mentioned Bonanza as an alternative to Raven. So why Bonanza? Well, Bonanza serves all the same terrain as Raven, but if you look closely on the trail map here, you'll see that Bonanza actually begins quite a ways uphill from Raven. As such, many people don't want to walk all the way up to Bonanza, which typically leaves it quite empty, even while Raven amasses lines. The one other unattractive thing about Bonanza is that, due to it being a fixed grip triple, its ride time is around 8 minutes, compared to just 3 minutes on Raven, but with the consideration of lines, Bonanza is still often quicker than Raven. Served by Raven and Bonanza are a ton of groomed blues and traditional mogul blacks. Wolf Creek's infamous glades are mostly on the other side of the mountain, which I'll discuss later. Powder Puff here is one of the most popular runs served by Bonanza. This little offshoot, Kaw, is super popular with the kids, as it is a narrow run winding through the trees. 
It starts and ends at Powder Puff, so your party can split up if need be. You can see these dashed lines all over the map. They are intended to show the easiest trails within each level of difficulty. For example, Kelly Boyce Trail is designated as easier than Bunny Hop. However, something I've found is that some of these dashed lines, especially the blues, are simply catwalks, which is why they're designated easier. These two crossover trails aren't necessarily flat, but they are roads. For me, that's not preferable, so I try to avoid these trails. Wolf Creek doesn't have a ton of great mogul runs, but many of these mogul blacks in Bonanza and Raven Zone are short little runs that can be pretty fun. Alright, that's about it for Raven and Bonanza. Let's head to Treasure Stoke. Treasure is a high-speed quad, and its base is situated pretty far away from that of Raven and Bonanza. If you're looking to go between the treasure lift and the Raven or Bonanza lifts, I would highly recommend taking the lift you are currently at and then skiing across to the lift you want to get to. This will prevent a lot of unnecessary hiking across the base area. Coming off of Raven or Bonanza, you can get to Treasure Stoke by skiing down legs. To get from Treasure to the aforementioned two, head to Treasure Falls or Bonanza Trail to get to these blues, which will take you down towards Bonanza and Raven. Off of Treasure, a vast majority of people go left and either go to the Alberta Zone or ski these blue groomers. Even so, these are nice cruisers that don't actually get all that busy, as is all of this stuff underneath Treasure. These runs directly under Treasure are great places to find some space to just cruise. Shown on the trail map is this D Boyce platter lift. It is kept around strictly for historical purposes and very rarely runs. Now, let's talk about Alberta. You can get to Alberta by taking the Treasure Stoke lift and skiing across, by taking the Bonanza lift and skiing the Bonanza crossover catwalk, or by taking the A-Way catwalk directly from the base. On the Alberta side are three lifts, the Elma Fixed Grip Triple, the Alberta Fixed Grip Quad, and the Charity Jane Detachable Quad, and very rarely are there lines at any of these three. Alberta lift is extremely long at over a 10 minute ride time and very occasionally gets short queues. It serves a vast amount of terrain, with very few groomed and even cut trails. A large majority of this terrain is just good old tree ski, just you and the powder. Obviously, there are a few traditional groomed trails such as Orion's Beltway, Feather Duster, and Gyro. Park Avenue and Coyote Park Trail are both catwalks, although, as is with all of Wolf Creek's catwalks, they don't require an insane amount of skating, pushing, or hiking. The Alberta lift actually ends just below the top of the ridge to help with wind exposure on the top breakover. You can hike up that extra little bit to the top of the ridge when it's open and hike along to access all of these chutes or more tree skiing over here. Generally, the farther away from Alberta you get, the more untouched the powder will be. Many a time has there been untouched powder several days after a storm all the way out at Voodoo Bowl or Sleeping Beauty Glades. Even as is, Alberta surfs so much terrain that it's easy to get away from everybody else and find that it's just you, the trees, and the snow. This waterfall area, accessible from either Treasure Stoke or Alberta, are chutes similar to those along the ridge, except for the fact that waterfall has dense trees. The nice thing about the waterfall area is that it doesn't require any hiking to get to or from. That does, however, mean it can be a touch busier than the other chutes at Wolf Creek. Now, if you're a relatively experienced skier that has skied plenty of areas, then you know that something's a little bit off about this trail map we're looking at. Right here in the middle of nowhere is a beginner high-speed quad. Never mind the fact that there's no way to access Charity Jane from the base area on greens, Wolf Creek wanted their new green terrain and they were going to get it one way or another, damn it. Charity Jane is empty. Always. I have never seen a line of Charity Jane. If you're crazy enough to want to get to Charity Jane for some reason, I would highly recommend taking Alberta and skiing down to it. C. Elliott Parkway is the one catwalk at Wolf Creek that requires you to push the whole way. Charity Jane's got some nice groomers to relax and cruise, but boy is it useless. Oh, and also, don't get caught in the expanse. I think that's enough said about it. Now, to leave the Alberta area, you have two main options. Off the top of Alberta, you can take Park Avenue to Navajo Trail, which will take you back to the treasure side of the base area. Your other option is to take the Elma lift from the bottom of Alberta. Elma itself serves a few nice blue groomers, but I personally don't think these trails are worth the painfully long ride time of Elma. 
If you are coming down these trails, do be warned that it gets extremely flat in this section, so keep up some speed once you start to see the Alberta base. Well, that's about it for Wolf Creek. I know that this was a longer episode than usual Insider's Guides, but it wasn't enough to constitute a part A and B, so if you stuck it out all the way, thank you so much for watching. As always, please put any questions down below. All my love, I'm out.